everybody. Welcome back for another edition of our Homeschool Family Favorite Spotlight. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Andrew Pudua, who is the creator of IEW, um, or the Institute for Excellence in Writing. And so uh, in this segment, we're going to be talking about their elementary and middle school language arts and literature um, program. So congratulations, Andrew, for, for winning in those two categories. Yeah, it's a delight. Homeschool family favorites. It's a wonderful idea and a nice chance to just, in a relaxed way, talk about some of the things that people have found very helpful. Um, language and literature sounds really, really big. Um, <sighs> and it reminds me of a short um, but very enlightening conversation I had once with the superintendent of a school district in Washington. Hmm. Incredibly smart guy. Um, had his, you know, doctoral degree. I knew he was smart, not because of that and that he was a superintendent, but because he was homeschooling his own children. <laughs> um, but he, he said something to me that was so interesting once. I was having a conversation and I said to him, I don't like the term language arts. I, it has a lot of baggage. When you say language arts to someone, they immediately conjure up in their mind all this kind of yucky stuff, like, you know, learning your letters and phonics and reading and spelling and cursive. And then there's, you know, grammar and composition and narrative story writing and essays and public speaking and who knows what else, you know, gets crammed in literature and poetry. And, and so for a lot of people, just the term language arts is not a, a pleasant one. It wasn't for me, which is why I said to him, I don't like the term language arts. And he said, well, that's because you don't know what they are. And I'm like, okay, took a humble pill. I said, <laughs> okay, what are they? And he said in, in a more kind of classical or traditional approach, there's only four and they are listening, speaking, hmm. reading, and writing. And then he said, the most intelligent thing that I have ever heard from the mouth of someone working in public education. It was so insightful. It, it actually gave me guidance for a decade. Wow. He said this, he said, one of our big problems in schools is that we work hard to teach reading and writing because those things can be tested, assessed. Right but we give short shrift to teaching listening and speaking because we don't and can't easily assess those things. And in doing so, in, in not cultivating listening and speaking well, we undermine our ability to have good reading and writing skills. Wow. And this, you know, this kind of just resonated completely with the line of thinking I had been on for the first decade of IEW. And when I met him and we had this conversation, it so affected me that it actually eventually became the tagline for our company. So if you go to IEW.com, you'll see our little laurel wreath with a pen logo thing. And underneath it says, listen, speak, read, write, think. Hmm. And so everything we do is, you know, funneling in to the integratedness of those those four skills. Um, what we don't necessarily realize is that writing is actually the culmination of those four skills. Um, when you consider, you know, writing, uh, you first have to have an idea. That idea has to come from somewhere. Most of the ideas that we get come through our senses. And they're stored in memory, experience, things we've heard, things we've seen, things that we have touched or felt. And all of our language that comes into our brain for really the first six, seven, eight years of life, depending, all of it comes through the ear. Hmm. Unless you have a person who is deaf or severely hearing impaired. So listening skills and cultivating that in young children reading well to them, picture books, and then short chapter books and expanding and never ever stopping to read out loud to your children. That's been a huge theme of mine for a long time. In fact, 
uh, I'm sure you know Sarah McKenzie. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's got her read aloud revival. Right. She came up with that whole idea as a result of hearing my talk, nurturing uh-huh. competent communicators. And I was her first guest on her podcast because she saw what I had seen is that almost everything that you do in language is based on the vocabulary and the ideas, the syntax and grammar that is acquired most powerfully in the earliest developmental stages um, through the ear. And so we need to saturate the environment of children, um, really of all ages, but most significantly of children before they're reading a lot, Mm. and especially for children who aren't reading a lot, you want to saturate their environment with high quality language, reading out loud, having formal conversation, and then, of course, even supplementing that with uh, audiobooks, which is, uh, you know, a great technology that we have today. Um, Because uh, left on our own, children will kind of flounder around in a very random uh, type of linguistic development environment where they're interacting with media or peers, they're getting information just kind of chaotically or randomly. And none of it is going to build that vocabulary, that higher level syntax, that higher level conceptual understanding, which then contributes to what? Reading something, right? So we, you know, we think, okay, children have to read. So they have to, um, you know, learn letters and the sounds the letters make, and then the the sounds that the combinations of letters make, and then they have to start practicing and recognizing those things and being able to decode on, you know, things on papers and screens and figure out what those are. What very few people forget, or, you know, what very few people remember is that, honestly, you can only decode a word that you already know. For example, let's say you're a little kid and you're six, seven, eight years old, whatever, and you're trying to read this word and it says, slagha, slagha, slagha. You're, you're thinking there is no such thing as a slagha. So this cannot be slagha. How do you know there's no slagha in the universe? You're old enough to know almost everything that is. Well, right? yeah, exactly. It's important <laughs> to you. So you say there's no slagaha, so this can't be that. And you stare at it a while longer, and then you you remember, aha, I G H, aha, that's that that E I G H. That's that I E E A A. It's A. It's E I G H, <laughs> like eight. And you remember. So then you try again. And you say slay. Oh, fantastic. It's a sleigh, but that only works, Leslie, hmm. if if you know what a sleigh is. Wow. If you don't know that sleighs exist and you don't have a mental concept of a sleigh, it might as well be a sleigh igaha. Right. And how are children in the world today getting the concept of sleigh? They don't use them in daily life. Right. People don't talk about them in daily life. So it's got to come from where? literature, or maybe movies, yep. movies that would have a sleigh, or maybe a fake Santa and a fake sleigh at the mall at Christmas, but we didn't <laughs> even do that this year, right? Right, exactly. So, uh, what, where do children build their concept of what something is? I argue primarily through, through hearing environmentally and being read to wow. in huge quantity growing up, because then that affects what they can read later. Also, it affects speaking. You can't really speak something that you haven't heard. I mean, you could try, but is it going to make any sense to anybody except you? And so our English vocabulary, our active vocabulary, is very dependent, again, on listening skills. Hmm. And how do we build that, right? Why is speaking important? Well, you could argue from a leadership rhetoric, you know, Christian responsibility to be able to you know, share the truth in a world of need, but in in a more fundamental, just kind of, you know, basic skills level, speaking in a way is prerequisite to writing. Hmm. You can't really write something that you couldn't say to yourself 
in fact, you do a lot of writing, I know, and you and David both, right? Yes. And, and what is that process when you write something? You have an idea. It's a mix of information you heard, experiences you had, maybe if you're, you know, fortunate, some inspiration or blessed, God gave you something, but it all mixes together. And what do you do when you write it? The first thing is you mentally, or sometimes even verbally, speak it into Absolutely. existence. Yep. If you don't speak the idea into existence, you cannot possibly write it down. Yep. Um, so you speak it into existence. Then, and here's where it gets tricky for kids to have, you know, learning difficulties. You have to hear what you said yourself say. Right, what you heard yourself say. You have to hear what you said to yourself. That's what right. I meant to say. To hear what you said to yourself. Then you have to remember the whole idea that you heard yourself say to yourself. Much like if we're having a conversation, I have to kind of remember the whole things that you've said up to the point for the next thing to make sense and flow. Right. You, right. So you have to remember not just one idea, but your whole sequence of ideas and hold that in your memory long enough. And if you're a child to go find the spelling words, you know, to go find the spelling of the words so you could write it or type it. Hugely complex, wow. hugely complex process. Uh, but that speaking the idea into existence, that's prerequisite for hearing and writing it. Therefore, when we work with kids in verbal language development, um, it's, it's hugely helpful and transfers immediately over to what we might call, you know, writing or composition. Right. So when, when you ponder all this and you think, okay, listen, speak, read, write, think, that's a lot of stuff to do, but it's easier than looking at it in all those other crazy ways. Yeah, for sure. Like, the dozen different subjects you have to fit into a curriculum. Anyone who has been at homeschooling long enough has learned simple is mm. good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you're not simple, you're going to get overwhelmed, maybe give up, feel like you're failing, um, want, want too much, you know, believe you can't do it yourself. Mm. But if things are simple, and so that's one thing, you know, that while we teach fairly sophisticated concepts we've tried to do it in a simple way possible yeah well let so, me let me segue then from there that is what you just said I had actually never heard that was so fascinating and I would love to just deep dive into that with you but with the time that we have left um, I would love to hear how all of that that you just explained to us which probably most moms had not heard how does that then work itself out with your language arts, for lack of a better word, program for elementary and middle school? What does it look like? Sure, sure. Well, <clears throat> we, um, we have uh, products that support all of these areas. Um, one of the ones that I particularly love is the poetry program. It's, it's actually <laughs> called Linguistic Development through poetry memorization, LDP is the code. So it's IEW.com slash LDP. And that is kind of like a Suzuki method. If you or anyone who's listening is familiar with Suzuki music instruction, mm -hmm. violin, piano. Right. It's very much like a Suzuki method for poetry memorization, mm -hmm. which goes a long ways to exploding, uh, like I said, vocabulary more sophisticated cons, uh, syntax and grammatical understanding. Uh, you know, we talk about learning grammar and that that's, you know, one of the language arts. And I could go on for hours about grammar, but at the core, the most important grammar you learn is your inherent or inherited grammar. Mm -hmm. So whether you go and get a blah, blah grammar workbook or you, you know, get an editing practice program or you, you know, ignore grammar entirely, no matter what you do, you will go into adulthood with the inherited grammar. Mm. And that comes from the things you heard and the things you memorized. Wow. Uh, which is why, of course, you know, parents who read to children 
give them an advantage in life beyond pretty much anything else that you can do. I would argue that second to that is children who grow up memorizing, uh, memorizing scripture, memorizing poetry, mm -hmm. memorizing excerpts from famous speeches, um, furnishing their mind uh, with those sophisticated language, you know, appropriate, but appropriately sophisticated and reliably correct language patterns. Uh, so that in, in the kind of is glue for us between the, you know, the listening business and then the yeah. reading and writing business, because that speaking is what solidifies. Mm -hmm. It moves words that maybe you understand in a passive vocabulary to, I can speak and write that word confidently, moving them into an active vocabulary. Right, right. Now, <clears throat> with our writing program, you know, it is very unique. You won't find our particular approach, I don't think, anywhere else. Uh, it's called structure and style. And if you go back to kind of an ancient rhetoric terminology, this would be arrangement and elocution. And then embedded in that is our uh, invention process or how to come up with ideas. But, uh, you know, if you hit me in an elevator and said, okay, you know, we're on the 13th floor, What's different about your writing? <laughs> Unless we get stuck part way, I'm going to have only a short bit of time to say uh, the most valuable thing that we do is we, we work to the separation of complexity, mm. the separation of complexity. Um, I'm sure you have met, I have met, I would guess almost anyone ever listening to this has met and maybe one of their children, maybe someone else's child, but they've met a child who hates writing. Mm. Maybe they were, you know, a, a student or a, a child who hated writing or disliked it or never knew what to do. Yeah. The reason I have discovered anyone hates anything, but why children hate writing in particular is they are overwhelmed with the process. Mm. They cannot find the idea. They say, I, I don't know what to write. I can't think of anything. Or they have an idea and their brain moves a million miles an hour and they can talk about it and tell everything they know about how to build Lego starships. And you say, fantastic, write some of that down. And they go blank because, you know, a, a child and a boy child in particular, their brain is much faster than their hand. They're, absolutely. Well, that's good. I mean, we want our brains to be faster than our hands. But so <laughs> what's the trick? How do you slow that down? And so... Uh, our system is based on separating complexity and solving the challenges one at a time mm. rather than having those challenges happen all at once. So number one, can't think of anything to write? Fantastic. Let's borrow an Aesop fable. Let's borrow a little bit of source text about an interesting animal or place or Legos, right? Anything. Let's learn to make an outline, a, what we call in our system, and I know you've done this, a key word right. outline. Do you move an idea from there over to here where it becomes useful? Then you put away the original. Okay, now you've got ideas, but they need to come back into full existence. Now they came from sentences, so they're going to go back into sentences. So this is much easier, but they're no longer in sentences. So what do you do? Speak the key words into sentences. Then you hear the idea in its completion, hold it in your memory, and try to write that down. And immediately you've taken this thing that is overwhelming into something that you break it into three or four steps along the way, give as much help as possible. And who, you know, I have actually had parents and teachers say to me, you know, in a short hour, hour and a half class that I'd be teaching, mm -hmm. that child has never written so much on a piece of paper in his <laughs> entire life. Why? Why was it possible in my class? Well, because of that separation yeah. of complexity. And then, you know, we, we operate, you know, at all grade levels. In fact, it's funny, I say sometimes to people at a convention, you know, if we were sitting in a convention booth talking uh, and you'd say, well, what grade is it for? I would probably say it, it really works very well with all ages and all aptitudes because it's a system. Mm -hmm. And I would teach the same thing to someone in graduate school or in third grade, but you know, it, it's the same thing I'm teaching. What differs is the sophistication of the source text or the, the ideas, right? Right. 
as right. well as the complexity of the checklist. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to teach keyword outlines and style checklists to everyone. Um, much like uh, when I taught violin, if someone said, I want to learn violin, Suzuki method, okay, well, the first thing you will do, regardless of whether you're four or 14 or 40 or 80, I had an 80 year old student once. Oh, wow. You start with twinkle, twinkle, little star and variations. Hmm. That's what everyone does. Why? Because it's a pathway. Yep. So what we have really is a pathway and you can step on at any age or aptitude. You can be a super high talent six-year-old who reads C.S. Lewis books independently and writes novels in her spare time. <laughs> or you can start with a 14-year-old child who's been you know, burdened by dyslexia or dysgraphia, and it's just really, really hard, and, and you don't know what to do. You can start our system with both ends, both extremes. And guess what? Everyone makes progress. Yep. Now, just to give you the very brief overview, um, we start with this idea of source text. So here's, like I said, a little Aesop fable, something interesting, short, take keywords, retell that. That's just unit you know, one and two of our system, but it gets everyone working with outlines and it frees anyone from the blank page panic. I can't think of anything. But then we move. Unit three in our system is summarizing narrative stories or retelling. You don't even have to summarize, you can elaborate, but retelling narrative stories. And this is where you don't take keywords from every sentence, but you do have an existing story to retell. Hmm. Unit four is where we introduce the first kind of idea of academic writing with topic-based paragraphs, and then the skill of limiting. So you have too much information and how do you summarize? Um, just quickly, I, I had this insight a couple of years ago. I was so proud. I thought, oh, this is so brilliant, or maybe it's inspired, or maybe somebody said it and I forgot who, and I'm just taking <laughs> credit for it. I do that all the time. <laughs> did you ever notice? Did you ever notice that kids, almost everyone, hates the word summarize? Hmm. It doesn't. It's not a positive word, right? If you say to a kid, summarize, they hate that. Wow. And I used to want. Well, I hate it. I used to wonder why, why does everyone hate this word? And then I realized why it's spelled badly. S-U-M-M-A-R-I-Z-E, -M -M -E. sum. Well, if you know any math talk at all, that means the total of something, right? What are you yep. doing when you're summarizing? You're not telling all that in this much space. Nobody yeah. can tell all that in this much space. You're telling some of it, which is why properly spelled, the word would be S-O-M-E yeah. hyphen A hyphen R-I-Z-E. And the sum would be not all of it. You wow. just choose some of it. And then it makes sense to people. <laughs> you can't. Like, okay, here's 20 facts. Choose five, write a paragraph. I can do that. Right. So we introduce some skills for summarizing, choosing what's interesting, important, or relevant. You can't tell everything. So that's unit four, topic-based paragraph. That becomes the building block then. Unit five, writing from pictures. This now is where you don't get a source text. You don't mm -hmm. get even a story per se, but you have a set of pictures and a methodology of thinking, asking questions to describe the events in those pictures. So it's kind of a weaning step from the dictated content to the blank page. That's unit five. Unit six teaches research multiple reference summarizing. So not just you have one source with too many facts, you have too many sources with too many facts. How do you navigate that? And it's just elegant. It's like that whole, you know, six week research paper kind of process shrunk down to microcosm. You can do a, a complete research process start to finish in an you know, hour and a half, two hours. It's gonna be short but it's complete. And then you learn the trees and the forest, you see the complete process, mm -hmm. and then you can go and apply that to some much longer form of academic writing. So I love unit six, and I have had thousands and thousands and thousands of adults say to me over the last 25 years, I wish I had learned this in high school, you know, and the great thing is, you know, you can learn it in high school. I could also teach it to fourth graders. Mm. Uh, and it's a skill that, you know, serve you your whole career, your whole life. Yeah. Your whole life. 
Um, unit seven is our inventive writing or write about something you know about, you know, from your memory, your imagination. And a lot of writing programs start there. They say, in order to learn to write, you have to think of something to write. And the kid's dead in the water. I can't think yeah. of anything. Too big of and a then, universe at that point. Yeah. And the, the mom or the teacher, the tutor or whatever, they're just trying so hard to just mm. come up with content. Everybody's exhausted after you've got some ideas. There's no time to do it well. Mm. What we have discovered is the opposite. If you teach a child to write by giving them plenty of content to practice on, much like plans for putting Legos together or recipes for cooking, right? Mm. Um, you do that for a while. And then what happens is you launch into creativity. You say, I don't really need to follow this recipe. I don't really need to do this Lego plan. I could make this cooler. I could make this better by breaking off and applying my own mm. external or additional knowledge or inspiration or experimentation. That's what happens in writing as well. But if you just throw someone a big box of Legos and say, make something cool, that's harder. Throw a kid into a kitchen and say, cook something delicious, right? Maybe, but, but there's a path to learning every skill. Yeah. So that's why we've discovered, no, don't say, Think of something to learn to write. No, learn to write. And in the process, learn to think of stuff. Mm. And that's why our tagline, listen, speak, read, write, think. That's the result of language arts. Uh, then, of course, you have two more units, eight and nine. Eight is all the formal essay models from the basic five paragraph that people love or hate, mostly hate, to a six <laughs> or seven paragraph expanded model, to a seven, eight, nine, ten paragraph expanded essay with expanded topics to a 12 to 17 paragraph super essay. I could get you even up to like a, you know, a 36 paragraph super duper essay. <laughs> if you need, a, you know, a 15 page term paper, I, you know, right. we have models for everything, but the great thing about the model is no one has to sit down and I say, I don't even know where to begin. No, right. when you have a model, you say, okay, there's a process. I'm going to end with this. The first step is do this. And that's, you know, what we teach. Well, and then unit fantastic. nine is our, uh, our critique, uh, which replaces the book report because nobody likes book reports. That's boring. But critique sounds more romantic. You get to criticize something. It's power. <laughs> you have power here. <laughs> you have power. Children love that. So anyway, those are our nine units. You can read and see more about those. Um, one thing I always mention, uh, I like to mention, is we have a magazine. Hmm. Uh, we give it out at conventions. We didn't uh, get to go to any conventions to give out all of our printed magazines, but we also have it online and it's called Magnum Opus Magazine, all one word. Uh, and Magnum Opus is Latin. It's plural for great works. Uh, and this is uh, an old, old idea I learned from my mentor, but basically you publish kind of to showcase the best work that you can. And then that allows you to show this to other kids and they can read other kids homeschool mm. writing or school class writing or um, other parents can read. And I think it's wonderful because these are just homeschool kids that have submitted things to our magazine and it looks beautiful. And there's an online edition every month. And then if you want a paper edition, uh, you can contact us, iew.com um, info at IEW.com and then uh, get uh, this magazine. And, and then you can really see, I think, clearly the results of this writing program in the quality that is represented in the magazine. And honestly, we don't cherry pick the very best of the best. We're trying to say, okay, here's a, an, an honest representation, you know, of the top half or so hmm. of the submissions we get. Uh, but, you know, there's some awkward stuff in there, and that's because a 12-year-old wrote it. Exactly. And they're awkward sometimes. So <laughs> anyway, there's Magnum Opus Magazine, and I should mention our podcast. Uh, it's called Arts of Learning, or, sorry, Arts of Language Podcast. Arts of Language Podcast, and you can get that at IEW.com or uh, through any of the podcast uh, normal, I don't know them all. 
iTunes. Uh, whatever and, you use to get your podcast, yeah. right? There's a bunch of them, yeah. That's right. So um, I, that's kind of the, you know, 10,000 feet overview of everything we do at IEW. And we have all sorts of free resources going. In fact, um, since uh, the, the schools got, you know, shut down and parents at home and a lot of people looking, hey, could I homeschool? I mean, my kids here anyway, or they see what the school is doing um, and thinking, is that what he's really getting, you know, in a class every day? And I'm not even sure I like that. And that seems like kind of not a great use of my child's time. So they're looking to homeschool. So what we came up with is um, free lessons and it's three weeks of free um, wow. writing lessons on our newest product. It's structure and style for students video course. So it's a hmm. full, you know, hour and a half or a little bit plus or minus class with me. And you can watch that live streaming and it comes in level A, which would be approximately grade three to five reading level B, approximately grade six to eight C high school and up. And so it's IEW.com slash free hyphen lessons, free hyphen lessons. Uh, and uh, this will give you three weeks uh, of that, as well as a taste of our Fix It Grammar program, which we didn't get a lot of chance to get into. Uh, but the Fix It Grammar uh, is a super easy one or two sentences a day, build editing skills, attention to detail. It's not a test. It's not a workbook. It's much more like a game. Uh, and it's been hugely popular. We've won all sorts of crazy awards. In fact, for the first time now, we're getting people who call us and say, I have your grammar program. Do you have anything else? Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. yeah. And we do. That yeah. was one of our side <laughs> products. And now it's an entry for people well, to come into a, and, the wonderful world of IEW. Yeah. And we're actually going to discuss that in okay. another uh, episode of the Spotlight because you have also been awarded a homeschool family favorite for your grammar. So uh, you'll be able to okay. tell us a lot more about that then. Um, but thank you so, so much for spending the time with us today to tell us about your elementary and middle school language arts. That was just fascinating information that I'm sure uh, will be very helpful to homeschool parents of all ages, no matter how young their children are, because um, you know mine are skewing much older now. And so looking in my rear view mirror and seeing the effects of what you were talking about, you know, we read a lot, we, we spoke to them um, just from the time they were very young, we engaged them in conversation, not knowing why, just knowing that's what seemed common sense, but, but hearing the why behind it and seeing, you know, now my kids are in college and they're so, I mean, the Lord has just been really good. They're so well-rounded. They're so well-spoken. Um, but seeing that trajectory is fascinating. So thank you so much for taking the time to share that all with us. Um, and congratulations again for your win. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Good deal. And for the rest of you, thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on Homeschool Family Favorite Spotlight. <laughs>